ahoj, tak všichni online? Já jo. Taky. A ty babi? Babi? Babi musíš tam na to kliknout. Ne, na to Babi druhý. musíš tam na tu ikonku. Sluchátko, babi. Vypadáváš. Hello everyone and welcome uh, to another debate which is part of the 14th edition of One World International Human Rights Documentary Film Festival. This unique event is organized by People in Need in cooperation with Czech Centre Brussels, the European Parliament and the permanent representation of the Czech Republic to the European Union. My name is Giga Faktor, uh, I'm a head of Brussels office of Europeum Institute for European Policy which is together with Human Rights House Foundation partner of today's discussion. Before I introduce uh, you to our distinguished speakers, uh, I would like to remind you that throughout this debate, you are encouraged to ask questions to our panelists, and you can do that either through comment section under our stream on Facebook or YouTube, or you can use application called Slido uh, under hashtag one world uh, information, how to access it should be visible now on your screen. All your questions will be directed to me and I will be, uh, well, I will do my best to address all of them. And now let's jump uh, to our follow-up discussion to a documentary you just watched uh, called The Foundation Pit. I'm joined by Mr. Urmas Payet, member of the European Parliament and also a former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Estonia. Welcome, Mr. Payet. Yes, hello, and hello. Hi. And also let me welcome Nadia Ivanova, Deputy Director of People in Needs Center for Human Rights. Good afternoon, everyone. I believe uh, that the documentary provided us with a very interesting insight into everyday problems of average Russian citizens. And maybe it was a bit of an eye opener for those of us who see Russia only as a strong actor on international field. Uh, I would like uh, to start uh, with asking uh, first Mr. Payet uh, and then uh, also Nadia uh, to share their impression for, from the documentary. So well, this uh, documentary, I guess, described uh, quite an emotional, but at the same time art uh, artistic way, how it well, looked back in the Soviet Union during very difficult times. And, uh, uh, what we can take from it uh, today is that uh, lots of this mentality we also saw uh, in, in this uh, cinema, in this film, is still there. So that although it like happened decades ago, uh, but the fact is that uh, big parts of this mentality is still there and, and influences a lot of also decision-making process in today's Russia, and also attitude um, to, to others uh, which have chosen different paths, especially well, democratic world. Thank you, Nadia. Your impressions from the movie? Well, um, as I was watching it uh, a long time ago, actually, for the first time, um, for me, uh, it was very interesting that although there was a very clear message on the surface from this movie how the life of ordinary citizens, um, ordinary Russians, are is different from the basically the uh, the picture that we are used to seeing in Russia, especially Russian propaganda um, and uh, Russian so-called news. Uh, but for me, it was uh, a little bit more of uh, about what I noticed from our professional standpoint, uh, it showed a lot of, uh, a lot of um, arguments for what happened in Russia in the past 20 years, like very successful centralization of power. People are not asking their local authorities to change their lives, but they go immediately to President Putin, which was basically his goal from, from the get-go. Um, there is also very visible how the, this tough grip that the regime has on the media space brought people to social media, and probably we will discuss it later, how they see it as the only way to try and get some information about the real lives to the authorities uh, upstairs somewhere up in the hierarchy. 
and also the level of mistrust that the people have among themselves and towards their local represent so-called representatives and that the only way they can somehow change it is basically shout from the top of their lungs um, about it on the internet and also what was the interest point for me and it's also by a little bit of a professional disadvantage probably that a lot of things that we saw in this movie are actually illegal in Russia. A lot of videos that uh, were chosen for this movie actually are illegal content. Either swearing online is banned or uh, offense to the authorities uh, is banned or some materials are even extremist materials there. So it's very interesting to see how something that we in the West can see as very normal, regular things that people talk about can be actually a punishable offense in Russia. Thank you, Nadia. We will definitely get uh, to the question of social media in a few minutes. But first, let me ask uh, Mr. Payet, uh, in the light of recent tensions between the EU and Russia, uh, is there a way to discuss the issue of violations of human rights with the Russian regime? Uh, you, as an experienced diplomat, do you see any possibility of improving the situation by strengthening the dialogue? Or is the only viable option really to taking this hard stance and putting economic pressure on Russia? Well, for dialogue, uh, there is need that also Russia wants to have dialogue. Uh, but I guess it's quite obvious that at this uh, moment of time, uh, Russia is not interested in having any, um, well, real dialogue with West, including with the European Union, as long as EU sticks to its principles. And one of the principles is the same, protection of human rights. So that in this sense, uh, today, Russia and China are very much on the same picture that they tell that, well, of course, we can discuss whatever in the world, but not our domestic. Uh, so that uh, if we look at the uh, level of relations between Europe and Russia these days, uh, then it's clearly a low point of all last 30 years. So that the tensions have not been so high during all this last 30 years after collapse of the Soviet Union. And it's obvious that, of course, there is completely no readiness for Russia. Well, speak about the internal issues of Russia, including human rights uh, with, uh, well, Western countries, including with the EU. So that uh, the only way how the situation, of course, uh, can change is if Russia itself in one day finds that now it's time to well come back to the EU and and well start to make real changes in this very difficult relationship we have at this very moment. Let's certainly hope for that. Uh, we've seen similar uh, situation with Turkey so maybe really one day uh, this can uh, turn drastically but uh, let's go back to the social media. Uh, Nadia, uh, in the documentary, we've seen many Russians relying on the role of the social media as kind of like a last resort, uh, how to be heard in this heavily se uh, censored media space. Uh, I wanted to ask you, how important are social media for Russians and which uh, social media platforms are the most popular? And also, uh, before uh, I finish, just uh, we've seen many people of older generations posting videos. Are maybe Russians more skilled in using these platforms? Well, um, I think that social media took over Russia the same way they took over everything else. At approximately at the same time, Russia is a huge market. It's 140 million people. So, of course, big social media giants wanted to, to take this market and use it. At the same time, Russia decided to try and create something of their own, like in famous Vkontakte, which is a, still an extremely popular social network in Russia. So at that time, around 15 years ago, when everyone were learning social media, um, everyone got on social media in Russia and weren't realizing still the potential of it or the dangers that it could bring to uh, either democratic powers, but at the same time to the regime. Um, soon after, actually, Russian government started to understand what can happen when you have this unrestricted space for people to talk about, uh, to, to talk 
to each other and to the government and talk about basically anything. And this could be seen at the during the takeover, basically a takeover of Kontaktia um, some 12, 10, 12 years ago, when um, basically FSB uh, pushed out uh, Pavel Dura from the country uh, and took over the whole network. And now Kontaktia is very much known for giving out any information that the government needs. Um, so yes, I think that considering that usually in a democratic society, media plays the role of somewhat the disinformation flow between two-way information flow between the citizens and the government in Russia, where independent media has been crushed and the only space is given to uh, to propaganda, people turn to social media to try to communicate. So yes, a lot of senior citizens are very much aware of what social media are and how to use it. At the same time, we have basically any social media that, that is present in the world, you can see it in Russia as well. TikTok is now newly very popular the same way as it's popular anywhere else. Uh, there is a lot of power in the Telegram chats and when government real or Telegram channels and when government realized that they tried to ban Telegram, which uh, they failed drastically at because it was basically almost impossible to do. So we see that in some ways social media actually win this argument. At the same time, we also see the increase in persecution for some posts or some content that is shared by in, on social media. So government is trying to squash this open space for communication as much as they can and in any way they can. But banning social media is almost impossible in, in any country since communities of IT specialists have been developing with VPNs and other ways to actually overcome those bans. Thank you. Uh, just like a quick follow-up questions to that. Uh, you said that it's almost impossible, but uh, even if it would be possible, would even government be willing to do it? Because I, I guess it would just cause an enormous outrage of the citizens. I mean, I, I think, of course, well, government, government, Russian regime is smart. They never just ban something especially if it's something that is communication channel, they offer some alternative that is fully controlled by them. So of course, banning Telegram created a lot of outrage, but again, it was impossible to do anyway. Uh, then we had an example where they tried to slow down Twitter. It somehow worked, but not much. So, but people were still using it anyway. And of course, government still offers alternatives like Contactia, like, um, um, I don't remember how it's called, the Mail.ru client, a uh, special Mail.ru client that tried to be this new Telegram channel, uh, which of course they didn't, they couldn't substitute it because Telegram is still Telegram. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, they wouldn't do it in a very like, not smart way, just banning everything, but they would try to offer it. But it's still it's still impossible. And for now, it's actually uh, it's actually enough for them to just punish people for for posts and if they need to. Uh, the latest example of uh, of Andrei Pivovarov from Открытая Россия for being prosecuted for basically reposting something. So it, it's just a pretense, of course, but it's still enough for them for now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Payet, uh, of course, uh, the European Parliament is very active uh, when it comes to the protection of uh, human rights and generally the European values. Uh, but what can the European Parliament do, not only in Russia, but generally in the neighborhoods when it comes to this question? Do you feel there is enough unity among the member states to decisively stand up uh, against uh, such behavior, let's say, in Russia? Short answer is no, uh, because if you, for example, look at the reaction, how slow it is uh, from EU's point of view, how difficult it is to reach consensus among 27 member states to react, uh, then unfortunately, EU and EU's common foreign and security policy can do much better. For example, last autumn, after events started in Belarus, uh, demonstrations against Lukashenko, uh, then it took for the EU around two months to agree 
uh, and to get consensus of 27 member states, even about, well, very modest uh, sanctions. Uh, what concerns Russia, then also, yes, we have had, uh, well, some new uh, people in sanctions list, but nothing uh, substantial. And, and also these days, uh, it was now already 10 days ago, when again in Belarus, uh, as we know, the Ryan airplane was taken down and a couple of uh, opposition people arrested. Uh, last Monday, more than a week ago, we heard big words uh, from the European Council, but now 10 days passed and no re-election. Uh, so that again, it shows uh, that still the disagreements, uh, what concerns details, what to do, how to react, are still there. And as long as uh, EU uh, cannot be much more efficient, what also concerns reaction to the events and uh, to the uh, human rights violations, be it Russia, be it China, be it Belarus or any other country, then of course the impact uh, also will, will be rather limited. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I hope uh, that at least uh, this past year uh, showed us that the European Union is trying to get better in that uh, stance and of course also the latest uh, well, uh, situation in Russia and Belarus uh, is a situation that needs to be dealt with. Uh, Nadia, when we uh, come to democracy in Russia, uh, also uh, ahead of the upcoming uh, parliamentary elections in fall, uh, what can we expect there? Uh, can we expect any changes uh, in the upcoming years or will it be more of the same in the decade to come? Um, I think we can safely say right now that this election in Russia, this coming upcoming election in Russia in September, are uh, is already very different story than we are used to. Um, I mean, Russia had a very tough decade when a lot of uh, a lot of countries around Russia started to uh, to basically go through revolutions and changes in government and more pro-European stance. So Russia got, Russian, Russian regime got actually a little bit scared of what's happening and feeling this instability, which is basically what happened with Crimea because Crimea, although being also some external factor for Putin to use against external uh, partners, let's say, or regimes or countries, it, most of all, it was an internal factor for him to to say that, look, my people, that's how strong I am, so love me. Uh, but um, this election, but any, in, in any case, in the last years, like in 2017, 2018, we still saw some level of at least visibility of free elections. Of course, they were nowhere near being free and fair, but government toyed with the idea of letting some people on at least on local level to be elected to the local uh, local parliaments or local councils or uh, candidates from opposition to be considered for uh, mayorships or even even Navalny was considered for mayorship uh, three years ago and now it's even impossible to imagine. So uh, this, this year, probably as Mr. Payet said, after what happened in Belarus, it, it actually influenced Putin a lot, apparently, or the regime. And they saw that even under the most uh, strict conditions, people still can go to the streets. So uh, this year, uh, nine months before the elections, when Navalny decided to come back to Russia, uh, they already started this campaign of basically squashing anything that is still viable uh, in the country. They started with the journalists, a lot of jur independent journalists were jailed for covering protests, either for administrative arrests or a fine, or even uh, some of them got under the threat of criminal prosecutions. Then uh, they started to make the laws even harder for everyone. They tried to ban and now are in a process of banning Navalny's organization as the kind deeming them extremists. And then they adopted the law that someone who supported extremist organization can't be a candidate for any position in, on, on any level of government. They started to um, 
to come up with new restrictions for undesirable organizations like us or uh, deeming major independent outlets like Medusa or V Times as foreign agents. So basically they started this campaign of preparing for the elections and banning anything that can be banned in advance. Uh, we actually see a huge increase of people who try to leave Russia, at least for now, at least before the election to, to go to safety and not be arrested uh, because this is a very major possibility right now in the country. So coming, up to your, coming back to your question, if anything can change, no, I don't think so. The chances are that we will see the same kind of election we, we have been seeing for the past 20 years. Although the scary thing for the regime is, and probably a good thing for us, that changes like we see, or activity like we see in Belarus, or as we saw in Ukraine in 2013, or in Armenia in 2018, they come unexpectedly. And there is a very big um, beauty in this unpredictability of, of people and not knowing what they will react to and what they will not react to. So. Probably for now, this is the only positive thing I can take from all of this. So uh, you mentioned uh, Alexei Navalny. Uh, you don't think that even this uh, big uproar, when it ca uh, which caused actually his arrest, uh, will not change much because uh, the government is prepared for taking care of the elections in a way they, they would like to see it. Basically, I think we already have seen the reaction to his uh, to his arrest and to his sentencing and, and then the reaction from the government because people went to the streets, went in masses, in masses that haven't been seen in Russia since probably 2011, 2012. Nevertheless, um, Navalny still got to, to, to the colony uh, and we still got a, a number of criminal cases uh, big, huge criminal cases against more than like tens of people uh, who were somehow involved in the protest or even those who weren't. So uh, now we see that basically uh, everyone is scared and the reaction was very brutal for Russian government. Of course, we can compare it to Belarus, but still. So I don't think that Navalny is the main trigger that would trigger some change. But again, as I, as I already said, there is a beauty and unpredictability of the people's reaction and what they choose to react to in masses. Mm -hmm. Mr. Pyatt will, will need to leave us soon, but before uh, he heads off, uh, there is one question from the audience uh, to him. Uh, do you think the rest of the EU does not take Russia seriously enough as they are not bordering with Russia and don't have a historical experience as the Baltics do? Well, I guess all are taking Russia seriously, but uh, the elements are different. Some countries are taking Russia seriously because they want to get something, like still the issue of Nord Stream 2. It shows that uh, certain political and uh, business circles in Germany are taking Russia very seriously because they want to get, uh, well, Russian gas. So that this is one clear example how every day's activity is 180 degrees against, well, the other realities. That there are, well, lots of conflicts going on also on human rights, but still Nord Stream 2, which clearly violates also common European energy policy, is still there in the process. Because, as I said, one country and certain circles in one country are taking, well, this economic interest very seriously. There are some other countries which have some other motivations. And this is also the reason why EU is very slow in reacting uh, certain, uh, to certain developments in Russia. We also can recall the recent visit of high representative uh, of the EU, Mr. S uh, Borrell to Moscow. Uh, well, it was obvious already before this visit that uh, this will be disaster because the atmosphere was already really bad, all the fresh events related to Navalny and others, but well, still, because some countries pushed uh, very hardly that, well, Borrell has to go to Moscow and to make another attempt to, 
uh, well, improve relations with Russia, which was completely naive and, and completely wrong calculation. Some countries said that, well, the timing is bad, don't go, you, you may go later, but well, this uh, visit happened. And now later we know that, well, those guys who said that don't go to Moscow, that the timing is very wrong, were right. So that uh, during this visit, Foreign Minister of Russia said directly that EU is uh, not a trusted partner to Russia. On the same day, they sent out a few uh, European diplomats from Russia, so that the language was very clear. And I guess that also finally, uh, all European decision makers also should understand that there is, at the moment, it's not in the interest of Russian regime to improve relations with West. They have chosen much uh, closer cooperation with other authoritarian regimes, like China, like some others. Uh, and uh, I guess the sooner all decision makers in, in Europe realize that this is the issue, this is the fact, well, the more adequate uh, decisions we in Europe can make. Okay, thank you so much uh, for your answer. Well, uh, it is definitely an issue because uh, a lot of countries are actually uh, acting very opportunistic when it, when it comes to natural resources and so on. Uh, let's go, uh, well, uh, I assume that you will need to leave us now, Mr. Payet. Uh, so I guess uh, I would uh, want to thank you for tuning in at least for a limited time that you had. Uh, and hopefully we will be able to discuss this uh, topic in future, maybe here in Brussels in person. So thank you uh, for your time and uh, have a nice day. And I will try to continue a little bit more with Nadia before also our time uh, finishes. Uh, so Nadia, uh, what uh, do you take uh, when it comes, uh, let's say also, if we go back to the social media platforms, you were mentioning uh, a lot of these uh, Russian social media that we don't know. Uh, is there any difference when it comes uh, to, be it Telegram or be it uh, Kontakte, to let's say the American platforms or like how people use these or those? And is maybe government uh, more willing to ban the domestic ones uh, or it doesn't really make any difference? Well, uh, first of all, when Contacti was developed first in, I don't know, it was 2006, I think, or 2007. Basically, if you compare interface of Contacti and then Facebook, it was basically the same. So uh, a lot of features and a lot of things were taken from, from those um, international foreign media, uh, social media platforms. As for the government, uh, Russia insisted several times, and there is, I think, the draft law on books right now in, in Russian Duma, um, that only those social media can operate in Russia who have servers based in Russia. Because, of course, they realize that they can't control, uh, totally control Facebook or Twitter or Telegram. And Pavel Durov was actually creating Telegram in a way that, that it can't be controlled, at least massively so um of course for them it's for now it's easier to operate with contact and uh, with that mailru agents and other russian inventions because those servers are in russia and according to current la russian legis legislation so-called sorum 3 or a package of Yaravaya, which is a huge package of laws that regulates online space in russia uh, servers in Russia are obliged to provide information to FSB if FSB needs it, or they, they are basically obliged to store it in a way that FSB has all the access it needs. So for them, of course, it's easier when people use Contacti because they basically can see anything that is happening there. And it's very much legit. They don't have to hack into anything. It's just the law. Um, so they're trying to create this tr format of legislation when they will be, um, when it will be the same for foreign platforms, although for now it's still very questionable if they will manage to do it. For Russian people, foreign 
social media are still more, they're still more user-friendly, they are more global because Russian people still have, they're still, live, they still live in global society. So they need to communicate with people outside Russia, which you probably won't find a lot of those who use Kontakte or whatever Mail.ru created. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it's a big question for them, which is where those laws and this legal practices of ba uh, ba uh, ba punishing people for what they write on social media comes from. Because for now, again, as I said, it's the only way to at least somehow control what's being said. Thank you. Uh, let's just hope that uh, these uh, social media platforms will manage to stay at least somehow, uh, well, when it comes to at least Telegram, uh, you know, independent from the government. Uh, we have one more question uh, from the audience, and I think uh, that will be just enough to cover uh, the time we have for this discussion. Uh, Nadia, what does it mean uh, being undesirable organization in Russia? How and what does change for organization labeled as undesirable? Um, so for us, uh, the label that we got on the 12th of November 2019 was a big blow. Uh, it's not that it was unexpected, uh, because when you work in Russia, you expect anything, uh, but it was um, unprovoked and without any previous, uh, let's say, innuendo or notice. So um, basically, when organization is deemed undesirable in Russia, it means that we had to stop any activity that we did in Russia, not because of us, because we live in Prague, so we are rather safe, almost, mostly. <laughs> uh, but uh, people who we used to work with in Russia are being in, endangered by, uh, by the law itself, by the same country that they try to make better. So uh, we had to stop all the activities. We had to talk to a lot of people and explain what's happening. We had to uh, uh, we basically had to make sure that no one can be punished for talking to us anywhere. So uh, officially now uh, the situation is that we're still able to work um, in, in other countries of the region. But recent, uh, recent uh, changes that Duma is now deliberating upon and probably that will be adopted very soon uh, they mean that no Russian citizen will be ever able to work with us anywhere in the world. Uh, we stopped working in Russia, but it doesn't mean that we stopped working in, in other countries. We are a big organization. We work in over 25 countries. But uh, unfortunately, this means that from now on, we will, be very, we will have to be very careful in choosing who we work with because we don't know if this organization, person, uh, or uh, or firm that we I don't know buy some produce from in Africa or in Philippines that they have sometimes some business in Russia because the way it's being seen like right now is they also can be punished and also of course it creates a vacuum between Russian civil society and international community and this is the intention of the law to cut off Russian civil society from any support or help, any form of support of, or help from abroad. Um, so it, it, it didn't hurt us as much as they hurt, as it hurt people in Russia and uh, organizations in Russia. We were 19 when we were banned one and a half year ago. Now there are 31, I think, organizations on the list and the list is growing. The recent ones were added just one week ago, uh, the first German organizations. So uh, this is something that will continue. And unfortunately, the more it goes, the less opportunity will, will there be for uh, Russian organizations to somehow protect themselves and be able to, to help their own citizens. So it's, it's very sad for us not being able to help where we can. Um, but this is the reality. Thank you. Uh, and maybe one little uh, question also from my side, uh, because I didn't have a chance before 
to react on what you said in the first part uh, of our discussion. You mentioned uh, how interesting it is actually that the people uh, direct those video messages directly to the president Putin, you know, that they don't go to the local uh, governments or local representatives. Why is it so? Is, is it just because of the figure and the way that basically Putin uh, worked uh, through the state uh, positions? Or uh, is it that they don't trust also the local governments? I think it's a little bit of everything. Uh, first of all, there is a long-term tradition in, uh, in Russia, starting from Russian Empire and going to 2021 where uh, there is a huge importance of the person on the top like it's it's impossible to imagine at this point at least russia is a parliamentary republic because uh, people are very used to having this one figure that is uh managing everything second of all uh partially it's mistrust in local government because there is this saying that or there is this understanding that everyone everyone steals in russia but locals they steal like directly from you and uh people higher ups they steal from big business so they don't concern us that much so there is this mistrust and somewhat tolerance to corruption that actually creates this um uh, this bubble on on local level that people can't talk to to their representatives there because those are the ones who steal from us so we will talk to someone above them because they don't steal from us they steal from someone else this is like a very simplistic, of course, view on things. And then the third thing is the nature of, of the regime itself. Through the 21 years that, almost 22 years that Putin has been in power first as prime minister, then as de facto of uh, the interim president and then as president and prime minister and again president, um, he made it very clear that he wants this system of his work as a vertical, he even called it the vertical of power. So it was very important for him and people around that around him to have this concentration of power in their hands to be responsible or not responsible, but to have control over, over everything, every level of, of being. And it was promoted like that when local elect when the elections of the governments, govern governors were canceled in 2005 when um, he started appointing like very small figures on the local level because he said that this is like what makes it safer and better for you normal citizen so the propaganda actually worked for creating this idea that when someone when putin is responsible or his people are responsible for something it means this is good and if you are the ones who are, who are uh, tasked with choosing your own governments, you actually may choose wrongly. So people are used to having this thing that everything comes from a top. So let's talk to person on top to solve our problems. That's how it works, unfortunately. Thank you. That's a very interesting insight. And I'm very curious uh, what will happen when uh, there will be no Putin in Russian uh, politics. Uh, Will they just get somebody else on the top or will there will be some transformation indeed? Anyways, uh, I would like to thank you uh, for sharing all your knowledge and for participating in this uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, I would also like to thank all of our viewers for following our follow-up. Uh, well, that sounds very bad following our follow-up, but to listening to our discussion. And for those of you who didn't maybe uh, had a chance to see the documentary itself, uh, it's called The Foundation Pit, and I believe uh, you can still find it uh, on the internet. Uh, I would like to invite you to the next session, uh, which is starting at 7.30. It will be a documentary called Fly So Far, and it was my pleasure to moderate uh, this panel discussion. Uh, hope you will have a pleasant evening and goodbye.